welcome everyone. My name is Jennifer Walinga. I am a professor of communication and culture at Royal Roads University and welcome to our webinar series on sport leadership and social change. We've been running this webinar series for I think over a year now and it's wonderful that we're now at episode 12 where we're going to be focusing on mental health and how to strengthen mental health in sport and through sport as a vehicle. We welcome a fantastic panel of guests today and let's get started. We always want to acknowledge that we're on the lands of the Kwisatzem and the Kwangan people. Whether I'm operating at the Royal Roads campus out in Colwood or at home where I've been actually for over uh, a couple of years now, I'm always on these lands and they're very similar. I have a wonderful pathway to my office on campus and I have a very similar pathway that I walk the dogs down in the mornings. When I'm rowing on the lake, I'm also closer to Wasanich territory, but it's so important for us to always reflect on the lands that we're operating on and on our history. We have a responsibility to reconcile and reveal the truths of the harms committed we have a responsibility to address the harms that have resulted from colonial and imperial attitudes. And at Rural Roads, we take it incredibly seriously because we are on ceded land. So we are in direct partnerships, uh, direct partnership with our indigenous neighbors. And so I think sport is such a wonderful opportunity to actually address the concept of reconciliation as well, because we're going through our own reckoning where we're having to be very bold and brave and acknowledging harms committed and uh, reconcile, work toward reconciling and restoring, repairing the harm within sport. I myself have a background in sport and literally so much passion for it. Continue to row each morning and uh, even got out there this morning, the water was glass, a little bit of fog hanging in the, in the trees. At Rail Roads, we try and embrace the learnings that nature offers us. We're surrounded by 300 hectares of old growth forest. We have a tree on our campus that's over a thousand years old. And you can go commune with that tree anytime you like. But we're constantly staring out at this beautiful vista, the ocean, the mountains, the old growth forest, and uh, constantly being taught the lessons of our the ecosystem that surrounds us. And again, I think I uh, really benefited from that as an athlete because I was constantly in nature. I have herons and eagles swooping around me, cormorants uh, balancing on the buoys and drying their wings, uh, gorgeous lessons at all time as I explore the lessons sport has to teach me as well. This is on our campus, it's a bridge. And I always like to highlight this because it's a key principle of our learning and teaching model that we try to acknowledge diversity. And so before you can build a bridge of relationship, whether it's a handshake or an actual structure, we need to acknowledge the differences beforehand. So in our school, we actually have a mantra of minding the gaps before we bridge the gaps, embracing diversity. Again, I see such parallels in sport. We also at Rural Roads embrace a flexible learning, uh, flexible admission model that acknowledges learning that is occurring in other contexts beside the traditional academic setting. So we acknowledge professional learning. Uh, we acknowledge learning that athletes like this beautiful woman here, Andrew, Andrea Burke, uh, gain through their sport experience as well. So we, we equate those two and welcome in uh, athletes into our programs, especially sometimes because they've been so busy uh, working at their sport that they haven't been able to uh, you know, accomplish a full BA. So sometimes they'll have partial BA, but we count their experience as credit as well. And so this really emerged from uh, my desire, my passion for sport, but also my passion for leadership development and um, a, real, a real desire to see leadership development happen through sport more intentionally and trying to highlight and promote the power of sport for positive social change. We teach a great deal of these concepts at Rural Roads. We have a number of schools that are interdisciplinary in their connection to one another. And it's a very progressive, positive social, so, social change oriented university. We often talk about social profit rather than nonprofit. 
And uh, a number of our programs will reflect the similar, the sim uh, similar principles that are embodied in these sorts of sports initiatives that we see across the world, like sport for development, diversity and inclusion, education, environment, equity, human rights, health, media and communication, and peace. And so we try to touch on these topics through the webinar series. And again, highlighting the power, the power of sport. We saw it at the games in Tokyo. Um, the Olympic and Paralympic games were rife with stories and messaging from athletes. They're, they used their voices increasingly over the past, I would say, couple of quads. Even the change from 2016 to 2021 was huge in terms of voice from athletes and the messaging that they were that they were sharing and highlighting about human rights, human health, well-being and fairness and equality. So welcome to episode 12, strengthening mental health in and through sport. So how can we do a better job in sport? How can we do a better job of leveraging sport to promote and strengthen mental health in uh, athletes and coaches and any participants in sport, but also people around sport because so sport is also for both human and social development. I wanna welcome our panel and I'll give a brief intro but I often begin the webinar and the, and the discussion with uh, a question asking everybody to introduce themselves through sport. You know, how did you find your way to sport? Why are you devoted and committed to sport? Because each of our panelists is still uh, participating and committing professionally to sport. Where does that all come from? So we welcome Dr. Natalie Duran Bush, founder of Canadian Center for Mental Health and Sport, and we will. We will link to all of these organizations when we post the recording of this webinar uh, online on our website and any other endeavors, initiatives uh, and uh, organizations that are mentioned during the webinar. We'll try and MR is a wonderful uh, person to be moderating this panel along with me. And so she'll be tracking things that have been referenced and we'll make sure that we link to those on the website as well and any uh, contact information people are willing to share. And Dr. Nat, uh, Krista Van Slingerland, who with uh, Dr. Dan, Duran Bush really initiated this center to address mental health and sport. And I'll of course let them talk more about that. And everybody on our panel wears literally four or five different hats. So I'm just saying a couple of roles that they play, but literally these people are uh, amazing and in what they accomplished. Dr. Charlene Orr, who works at the Canadian Sport Institute Pacific out here in Victoria and is the mental health lead there. We have Dr. Adrian Leslie Tuga, the Director of Sports Psychology at the Canadian Sports Centre in Manitoba. And again, all of these people also teach and lead in different ways in different contexts. And Dr. Veronique Boudreau, who is the Mental Performance Consultant at INS. Uh, the Institute in Quebec, and also a professor. So welcome everyone. And at this point, what I'm going to do is I'll stop sharing my screen. We'll be able to see all the beautiful faces and uh, we'll begin some introductions and then launch into some more organic question. I often say to the panelists, if you turn on your mic, it signals to me that you'd, you have something to contribute or like to say. Uh, I also try to prompt and make sure that everybody has an opportunity to, to share and speak and, and, and comment. And to our guests who are watching the webinar today, we try to retain some time at the end, but I find it actually works better if people can pose questions as we go and as they arise for you in the chat. We'll be monitoring the chat. I keep my eye on it. And that way I can... Uh, I can see what you're thinking about or what you'd like us to talk about as well, because, of course, our audience today is quite big. We've got over 80 people today, which is quite miraculous when you think of how long COVID has been going on and how many Zooms we've all been in. I just have to congratulate people for attending and partaking in this. It's wonderful to be here, um, to see you all here today and this time. But of course, we're also recording. And so we'll post the recording on our website, along with all the other episodes uh, in our own little YouTube channel there, but also on the website, you can access it. So please post in the chat as we go. I'll keep my eye on that and let's get started. Wonderful. And of course you can play with your view as well to see you know, who you wanna focus on and what faces you wanna keep your eyes on at any one time. 
Thank you. Great to see so many friends and uh, and connections across the sports system. Wonderful community here. And please continue to share where you're coming from and, and maybe roles that you play. It's wonderful to see that in the chat as well. Okay, so what I'd like to start with, if we could, and can I start with you, Natalie? Can you tell us a little bit about your, your involvement in sport, what drew you to sport, what keeps you in sport, and what would you say your, you know, a, a big goal for you is within sport? Hi, everyone. Thanks, Jennifer, for inviting me to be part of this wonderful panel and webinar. Um, so I am Natalie Duran Bush. Um, and uh, I guess do you want me to just share a little bit what I'm doing now and then get into uh, why uh, I'm in sport. Uh, so my main job is as a, a prof at the University of Ottawa in the School of Human Kinetics. And through my work, uh, I also obviously do research um, and I do uh, teach and I also consult. So all that together has eventually led me to, to do a lot of work in the area of mental health and mental performance. And with the lovely Krista Van Slingerlin, we um, decided to create the Canadian Center for Mental Health and Sport uh, back in 2018. And uh, since then as well, I continue practicing as an MPC, like many of you on this call. Uh, I've always, I've never been a high performance athlete. I've always been a recreational athlete, uh, just dabbling in different sports uh, growing up, but also uh, as a family, we're definitely, I uh, guess what you would qualify as a sport family, uh, doing sports together. Um, and, and as a parent, I've just thoroughly enjoyed watching my kids play competitive sport um, at the highest level that they were able to achieve. And, and then I would say, uh, having done a degree in kinesiology, I was really drawn to the psychology aspect of this. And this was, was really what drew me in uh, to the, the field and the profession and uh, decided to specialize in that field and then obviously play different roles and, um, you know, huge advocate for the profession of, of uh, mental performance consulting, like many of my colleagues here, and uh, believe in the importance of mental training uh, so everything that we call mental performance and mental health uh, for, for, to succeed in sport at all levels. And this is why I'm still here. This is why uh, I'm, I'm supporting the profession and supporting the future generations of people who are going to join us and make a difference, uh, like you said, Jennifer, in and through sport to just better society in general. That's me. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I always tell my students, world peace, go for it, you know, have big goals. <laughs> and for the, yeah, for the sake of everyone involved, love it. Thanks. And thank you for the work that you do, Natalie. And Krista, can you tell us a little bit about your background and what brings you to sport, what keeps you in sport? Certainly. Um, sport has always been a part of my life. Um, I played a million sports growing up, again, in a big sport family with, well, three parents actually who played a university sport. I have my, my parents are divorced, but on both sides, you know, I'm getting a lot of sport influence and a lot of passion for sport and two older brothers that I really connected with through, you know, playing road hockey and one-on-one -on, -one on the driveway. Um, sport was a way that I have always connected with other people. Um, and I played basketball in university. And it was through that experience that I, I um, experienced um, depression, anxiety, and actually post-traumatic stress disorder. So that's where sport and mental health really intersected for the first time for me. And I became really interested in it. There wasn't a lot of work being done, particularly in Canada at that time. Um, and I was really unhappy with my experience um, and the support that I kind of didn't receive and the lack of understanding that I saw. Um, and that has motivated me to make a difference in this space. Um, and that started with co-founding the, the Student Athlete Mental Health Initiative. Uh, that's now a charity that works to protect and promote the mental health of Canadian university and college student athletes. Um, and then, you know, went on into academia, met uh, Dr. Duran Bush, and yeah, we uh, co-founded the Canadian Centre for Mental Health and Sport, which has been just probably the most fulfilling doctoral project you could ever um, embark on. And um, yeah, now I have the pleasure of implementing uh, the Canadian or the mental health strategy for high performance 
abhorrent sport in Canada, uh, in our, our system, which I mean, it's, I would say the most robust mental health strategy in, in the world uh, at, for the high performance sport level. So it's challenging and um, unprecedented. And I'm just loving having that applied focus and continuing to, I hope, make a difference at um, multiple levels of our system. And uh, what keeps me in sport is, um, I mean, it's the most amazing mental health maintenance tool you could ever find. I recently came to a new sport and rock climbing. And for the first time in 20 years, I am so jazzed about a new sport and just like hungry for it. And it's, uh, it's such a, a nice place to be in. Great to hear. Yeah, isn't that amazing, right? Discovering a new one. And I love that you refer to the past. You know, look how far we've come in a short time, but what the norms were in the past and, and how we can get involved and, in, like you say, uh, initiate new concepts, new ways of doing new organizations, new practices to advance change. So great illustration. Thank you. And how about Charlene? Okay. Thank you, Jan, for inviting me to be part of this panel. It's uh, this really is truly a, an esteemed panel. And so I, I feel very fortunate to be among these women. Um, my journey started uh, similar to many of you probably. Uh, my mom put me into figure skating because she was afraid I wouldn't be able to participate in birthday parties as I got older. And, um, and that and the love of dance kept me in that sport. I truly love the sport from the time that they recorded, you know, in kindergarten, what are you going to be when you grow up? I had written down figure skating coach and that did not change until I got to my undergrad degree. My dad had stipulated that no matter what happened with your figure skating, you were going to go to university. And so I thought, what does a skating coach need from university? And I thought, well, of course, a kinesiology degree. They need sports science training. So if I had to go to university, because that's the pathway that my parents had put forward for me, at least I was going to study something that would help my figure skating career. And, uh, and so I pursued it and I, I got quite far. I trained at one of the best figure skating clubs in Vancouver at the time and across the country, um, but I didn't quite get there. And I didn't quite get there because of my mental health, um, as well as I just didn't have the mental skills <clears throat> to protect me from stress that I felt as a figure skater. But I met a mental performance consultant who, changed my outlook. Unfortunately, that mental performance consultant lived in Ottawa. And for a figure skater in Vancouver, that was a really hard distance. And at the time, we didn't have Zoom to have these kinds of meetings. So I only got to meet with this gentleman once a year when I went to the national camp. That wasn't quite enough of what I needed. And so when I found the field of sports psychology in university, I thought, ah, I know what's next. Because at that point in my life, at 19 years of age, I thought, do I really wanna be on the ice at 4.30 in the morning to coach? And that changed my perspective. And I didn't know that later I would become an academic and get up at 4.30 in the morning so I could write papers while my baby was sleeping, but that's another story. Um, and so I pursued sports psychology because of my experience. And today I am the lead of mental performance, sorry, there is a bit of a title change, of uh, the Canadian Sport Institute Pacific. Um, I have a full-time career as a mental, uh, a mental performance consultant. Um, I spent the first couple, well, I guess really the first half of my career, first 10 years of it as an academic, much like Natalie, um, teaching sport and exercise psychology at the University of Lethbridge. I still have adjunct status today and continue with my research. Um, I work as the lead of mental health and performance for Cycling Canada, and I am considered a senior uh, mental performance practitioner um, by Sports Scientist Canada, working the last 10 years primarily in high performance sport, um, where there is considerable stress and uh, risk for mental health and well-being. Um, I also, as, as some of these other wonderful women do, I serve within our community. Uh, currently I'm serving as the chair of the Canadian Sports Psychology Association, 
um, and do take part in a number of meetings within Own the Podium and the Canadian Olympic Committee as well. Um, and so it's, it's a real passion of mine to help people become the best versions of themselves. And I, I just love sport because it is a micro um, system of our life in general. And, uh, and so I'm super passionate about helping people in that space. Thanks, Jen. Thank you, Charlene. So as I mentioned earlier, you can see just the hats piling up on top of everyone's heads here in this panel. And thank you for all the work you're doing. Adrian, next. Okay, I knew it was down to Vero or myself and I just wasn't sure, you know, so they're saving the best for last, Vero. There you go. All right. Um, where to start? I feel like, gosh, okay, Adrian, keep it, keep it simple here. I could go for a while, as you know, Jen, so I'm just going to try and be concise. But uh, very passionate about the space. Uh, first, I was thinking, I love that you're connecting sport to this. I think sport and athletes have been absolute leader, leaders in mental health, whether it's several years ago with Kevin Love going to the hospital with a panic attack and realizing that he didn't want to tell people about it. There's a great article on Players Tribune around it. Um, and then being willing to admit it was a panic attack and talking about it because he wanted people to know. Uh, whether later this month we have Bell Let's Talk Day, which is an athlete-led initiative with, with a Canadian athlete who had the courage to talk about mental health issues, wrote a book about it and spoke about it. Um, and then at the last Olympic Games, we had an unbelievably courageous athlete in Simone Biles, who's the best in the world. And people, you know, they're human beings first. So for myself, I'm a human being, you know, I'm a human first kind of person. I, I really create, uh, you know, it Char had me over at, uh, at her CSI specific. And I, I gave a presentation on how, how can we create um, human first brave spaces, which is really what we're doing in sport. Um, so you know, that's one of the things I love about sport. It's really interesting. There's all these different theories out there. And one of them is called acceptance and commitment therapy act. And the big thing with that is how do we live more moments with meaning and purpose? And what I love sport about sport is there's an accountability to it. If we're having mental health issues and struggles, you have to be physically well and mentally well to be your best. And we can tell when you're not. And so we have to create spaces where people can tell us that they're not, and we can embrace people with who they are. But for me right now, what I'm loving is learning about people's stories, people I've known forever and not hearing about them. And um, I think everyone shows up with a story and, you know, we have to be non-judgmental and accept all parts of them. If their, their body's weak and not doing things, we help that body be stronger. Um, if people are having mental health struggles, it's, it's, it's not a big deal. It's like, how do we help them be the best version of, of themselves? As Shar said, um, my journey in sport, it's been a huge part of my life. Um, it's been where I found community and identity and safety and security. And I'm just very passionate about the role sport can play in people's lives. And uh, similar to other folks, I, I feel like we intersect a lot and I, I wear a number of different hats. I've had the unbelievable privilege of working in sport and also in other contexts as well and helping to pe uh, people be the best versions of, of themselves, whether it's, you know, air traffic controllers um, or you know, emergency response team, uh, RCMP members or emergency medical doctors or lots of other contexts um, where you do have to be courageous and brave and learn. And interestingly, I just listened to a podcast I loved and it was an ER doc and he spoke about the process of life and how do we make it sustainable? And he's like, the magic happens when we prepare for things, we go and execute, do our best, then we recover. And then the last one I loved was then we evolve, we become better. And how do we stay mentally well? Um, you know, we stay mentally well by continuously engaging in that process and having the courage to ev evolve as human beings, because he said, if you don't do that, then you break. And I think that's where in sport we saw, we've seen people break um, because, you know, after an Olympic games, when they don't perform the, want, the way they want, we don't lean into that recovery and help them evolve as people and become better, whether it's an athlete or a coach, it's, um, you know, sports, the highest highs and the, and the lowest lows. So um, thank you for the invitation to be on here. I will wrap it up. And I look forward to hearing from Vero. Thank you, Vero, you're next. Okay. Sorry. I know. Hi everyone. Thanks Jen for the invitation. And it's so uh, inspiring to hear about uh, these inspiring women's uh, stories that uh, in the beginning of my career, I have to say that Charlene, Adrienne, Natalie were kind of um, inspiring figure in the field of sports psychology. So to be uh, surrounded by them in this panel is really an honor for me. So thanks, uh, Jen, for the invitation. 
Um, my journey in sports uh, starts uh, with uh, cross-country skiing. So um, I started cross-country skiing at the age of, I think, eight years old. And at first, so I'm from a, a little community in Quebec City uh, near Montreal, which is called Mont Saint Anne. So there, it's a ski resort, and uh, mostly everyone in that little town is a, either an athlete or a coach or um, someone active. So every kids um, are at a young age put into a sport and usually bring into competition. And I was fortunate because all of my friends were also in the regional club. So we were a bunch of, of girls and boys of the same age uh, going to high school in the sports study um, program. Uh, the bus just took me from my street and brought me to the mountain so I could do my sport. So it was like all my life for my uh, high school. And then, um, well, I, like many, many athletes, my career did not last uh, really long. I, I ended up, uh, um, I had a knee injury at the end of uh, high school. So I stopped training for a year and then it became um, hard to, to get back. So I decided to move uh, uh, the focus on my study. But many of my friends uh, at the time still uh, continue a career uh, in sports. And I became a coach a couple of years after coach in uh, cross-country skiing and also in mountain biking. And still today, I'm always, when I have some times, I always go outside uh, doing cross-country skiing, mountain biking, uh, hiking, split boarding. It's really a passion for me and it has always been. Um, I decided to uh, do study in, in psychology, in clinical psychology, actually, because I always have been interested in, in uh, people, emotion, thoughts, um, I experienced anxiety at a young age and later understood that in sport, I was really anxious about my performance and did it not really ask for support or did not really have some support because at the time uh, we did not have a mental performance consultant or a mental health practitioners working with us. And so we were kind of relying um, each other in, in, with our peers. Uh, I had great coach. I was lucky, but still would have need maybe more support to deal with that anxiety and pressure, uh, performance pressure. But it was really during my doctoral study in psychology uh, when I was trained in uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and I was working with depressed um, uh, people and people with uh, anxiety uh, trouble. I was helping them dealing with their thoughts and their emotion and behaviors. And I just realized that, oh my God, this would be so relevant for athletes learn to deal with their, these thoughts at like important moment. Well, it would have been really important for me at the time and for the athletes I was coaching, I was feeling that there was something missing. So I decided to uh, specialize in sports psychology and then I learned about the field and everything that was uh, uh, been done in Canada and get to know those uh, really inspiring leaders in the field. And um, by the time, so I got uh, my training to be a mental performance consultant. Then uh, I became a clinical uh, psychologist and I specialize with athletes. I'm now working at the CCMHS, the Canadian Center for Mental health and sports through Natalie and Krista. And um, because I was so passionate with the development of the field and by um, having more people train to be able to uh, provide support, mental performance support and mental health support for athletes, I wanted to uh, do some research in the field and contribute to train. Uh, some, some of these students who wanted to also be mental performance consultant and uh, mental health practitioner in sports. So now I'm a full-time professor at the, the School of uh, Kinesiology at the University of Sherbrooke, where I teach a sports psychology class. I have students there that I'm supervising and I'm conducting research in the area of mental health uh, with uh, Nathalie durand -Bush. So yeah, this is how I, I came into that, that field. And yeah, something I can say is I truly believe that sports 
is a positive driver for mental health and development. So it's important for me to work in that field so we can provide good support for the athletes, so we can provide them everything they need to develop well um, within their sports journey. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. For And you can really see the stories, the pathways, the avenues, and how powerful that could be for those listening or, or you know, maybe having their own stories and how they can connect and relate. So I really appreciate everyone sharing their background that way. And also highlighting the power of sport and the role it's played in your life to inspire you in different directions, different ways. Wonderful. Uh, I, I love, Vera, that you finished off with this this differentiation between mental health and mental performance. And so I'd like to start there. One of my first questions is around, what do we mean by strengthening mental health in and through sport? What do we even mean by strengthening mental health? Is it possible to have mental health skills like it is mental performance skills? What's the difference? Who'd like to start? And anytime you wanna chat, just put your mic on and I'll recognize that and welcome you in. Adrian, go ahead. All right. I think for me, I really find the model uh, from the Canadian Mental Health Association with the mental health continuum very valuable. And I think that it starts with self-awareness and just like we pay attention to our physical body and how it's feeling. And in sport, for sure, we're very good at taking care of our body because we know our body has to be healthy in order for us to continue to perform. And so we pay attention to aches and pains differently. We notice it and then we do what we need to stay well. And I think that um, I think it's very powerful when we take the same um, kind of mentality or perspective with mental health and well-being, where we start to pay attention to ourselves and when we are struggling. Uh, for everyone, it's very different. It might be that you know you're sitting in a team meeting and you're just not able to focus in the same way. Uh, it might mean that you're not sleeping as well. It might mean that you're a little bit sharper. You're not letting go of coach feedback as much. But we all have those signs or indicators that we're struggling a little bit with our mental health and well-being. Um, and in my experience, we're not very judgmental with the physical things. We just sort of pay attention. That's what our body needs. And we do what our body needs. Uh, but with the mental health and well-being there, we can sometimes think, oh, I should be stronger. This shouldn't bother me. Um, we're not as uh, non-judgmental, I guess, with that. And I love the idea of just paying attention to it. And I've actually taken the the mental health continuum and I sort of made a more sportified version where there's three columns and working with um, in different parts. So for example, working with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, we actually up in our training room, we have the mental health continuum and we use the ter same terminology they use in the strength room. You're either healthy, um, you're hurt or you're injured. Um, and that's terminology the coach is familiar with. Um, and you know, if you're hurt, that means you're struggling a little bit, but you're still available to me. And when you're injured, you're not. And that's just terminology we use. And, uh, you know, we talk about whether you're, you know, a green head or a red head, and uh, we just talk about different things that we can do to, to stay well. So I think that we're all human beings. And that's one of the gifts of the global pandemic is it's forcing us to recognize that a little bit more, maybe. Um, but we can all experience stress and anxiety, we all have our breaking point. And I think that we definitely can do things to help ourselves stay well, we can use strategies to help ourselves get back to well. Um, and we can all identify the things that we need in our life that help us to be mentally well. But you know, and in, in sport, for sure, um, the load sometimes is too much. We break physically and we break mentally and that's okay. Um, but we have to be empowered to do what we need to get ourselves back. So that's, that's what I think about when you ask that question. Thank you. And thanks for, this has come up a couple of times too, that alignment between the physical and the mental and why would we be judgmental here, but not here and, and love that you've, that you have borrowed from the physical continuum and applied that to mental to help people understand uh, the similarities. Thank you. We'd like to talk next about this. Charlene, go ahead. Yeah, I, I find the, the same model extremely helpful. Um, and I also use the physical body as um, a starting place to, um, to make analogies with the brain. And, you know, just like, as Adrian explained, you do certain behaviors and habits to keep your body healthy, you eat certain foods, you move it in certain ways, you, um, you might take care of it through some sleep, you, you know, there, there's just different pieces that you would do, you can do the same thing for your mind that enable you to have a certain perspective of the world, uh, create some robustness. So when those stresses and those pressures come, you're just better resourced. You have 
you know, you have a larger support network around you. Um, and, and I don't know if we call them skills or competencies or attitudes, which is the common language you would hear certain attitudes, certain perspectives that one can adopt that will enable them to take the situations, the pressures, the, the stresses that are common, common. And, and we just, as human beings, engage with. Um, we never necessarily want these things in our lives, but we engage in them. And, and that's, you know, I think, when I think of strengthening mental health, I think about what are my resources? And how to, how to confront the stressors that are realities in, our, in whatever context, but sport for sure how to engage with them, good word, how to process. These are all skills. Thank you. And Krista. Yeah, following on, on Charlene's commentary, um, I often talk about mental health assets. So external assets like your support network, like your mental performance consultants and your mental health practitioners, and then internal assets, which includes those mental skills. And what I find so fascinating about this intersection is that um, as I learned more about sports psychology and did an incredible amount of therapy so that I could be well, I saw that there was a lot of uh, overlap in the skills that I was learning in a therapeutic setting and what's being taught in sport. So, and, and they're just being directed in different places, things like our ability to self-regulate, um, to be mindful, um, to manage stress, to bring down our, our levels of anxiety. You can turn that towards your sport performance. You can also turn it towards maintaining and getting back to positive levels of mental health. And so I think that's such a cool intersection that we can draw upon um, in sport. Wonderful. Good distinction. And and Natalie, what about the difference between mental performance skills and health skills? Do you have comments to make on that? Sure. Uh, for me, there's a lot of overlap. And, and I always say, for some reason, I, I, I don't really understand why there's been so much stigma around the construct of mental health. Because when you look at the definition of mental health, at least from, you know, some of the, some of the organizations that we know really well, like the World Health Organization, um, it, it when you dissect it, you see how much overlap it has with mental performance. So, uh, you know, you have different dimensions that uh, have already been alluded to, like emotional well-being, social well-being, uh, psychological well-being, and, and ultimately, it, it's about... Um, it, it's about managing your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors in a way that allows you uh, to enjoy life, to uh, be productive and achieve your goals, to cope with the normal stressors of life, and to make a positive contributions to society. So when you look at that definition and you look at uh, what we do to strengthen mental performance, there's just so much overlap. And so the skills that we develop uh, in our profession as mental performance consultants uh, when we're working in the sport community uh, can certainly help to foster just very naturally mental health. And like uh, we've heard from the stories to help buffer um, you know, uh, some of the risks uh, that, that we all have to experience mental health challenges. So I really like, obviously, we need to be able to tease out those two components, but I, I see them uh, going hand in hand. And this is why um, we all play a role uh, in this profession and uh, have a duty of care uh, to be able to help uh, athletes, coaches, staff to be able to sustain their mental health. And we can do it through mental performance and other ways as well, because we know that when uh, there's a more impaired uh, functioning uh, performance, then obviously, you know, we go down that continuum where we would seek help from uh, people who are clinically trained, like Adrian and Veronique, right, as clinical psychologists and counselors. So we need to know the difference, but there's just this really nice complementarity. And I think once people realize that in terms of strengthening mental health is really um, having that literacy, ha having that language, that knowledge that, that 
um, this is just daily things, daily functioning, daily performance that we're talking about. It doesn't have to be taboo and it should be part of our day-to-day -day functioning in sport, right? I think all of us would agree to that. Absolutely. Yes, yes. And Vero. And I can add to that, that like you mentioned, Natalie, there is so many stigma around mental health, uh, mental illness in sport. And I would say that um, a mental health skill that we can work to enhance in athletes is, is self-compassion, you know, because often one of the barriers that we see is that they feel like they shouldn't like experience these normal anxiety or depressive mood episode that everyone else is um, experiencing in, in their life huh? because it's like physical health. We all have sometimes episode that we feel um, uh, less good than other time. And often just like working on that self-compassion um, way of, of being toward themselves can help uh, normalize and just like um, realize that it's okay sometimes to not feel okay. And then they can have access to be able to use those mental health, mental performance skills and other um, strategies that they, they, they already have um, to cope with these, uh, these episodes or symptoms or um, just times where they feel um, not at their optimal potential. Yeah, and like many of you mentioned that sometimes it took a while to even recognize that you were struggling until later you started to look back and go, oh, I could have used some support there. But also recognizing, so also recognizing that we do possess skills or tools or resources that will, will help us but being able to actually, that literacy piece, we able to articulate that. Do you think this is just to build on some of the things people said, do you think the stigma is, is exacerbated in sport? Is it unique to sport? I mean, there's stigma around mental health across all contexts, but do you think it's, it's more in sport? What do you think? I can go. I think it's, it is really present in sport and research is also highlight that it's a huge barrier to seek help for, for athletes. Um, I mean, it, in some sports environment, we know that there is some cultural norms uh, that are encouraging, um, you know, um, some, some kind of, of, of belief like no pain, no gain. Uh, it's okay to train even you're, if you're injured. So all mental toughness also sometimes can kind of have this little um, hearing around uh, you can injure, sacrifice everything for performance, you know? So that can lead effectively, uh, that can lead to, to more stigma because uh, for example, we know in, in the larger society that mental illness is still associated with uh, some ID like vulnerability, uh, being not enough strong enough, or it's, a, it's, a re it's an illness that you cannot uh, cure and that is really, um, toward the individual and in sport because sometimes performance and well-being are uh, deemed apart it can yeah uh, legitimize also some behaviors um, that are really um, opposed to mental health and, and well-being for example uh, uh, having restrictive eating uh, behaviors um, going back after injury while you're not uh, ready to, to perform. Um, so if these little kind of cultural norms that sometimes are not directly state, but are kind of surrounding many cult sports culture are encouraging a stigma uh, around mental illness in sports. Absolutely. Yeah, these underlying beliefs. Krista. Yeah, I mean, Vero highlighted a lot of the uh, these core reasons why sport culture so um, reinforces stigma. And I, what is interesting, like Adrian um, and, and Shar, they both talked about drawing the parallel between um, the mental health continuum and the physical. 
um, and this hurt versus injured narrative, I've been thinking about so much recently. Um, certainly in the you know sport context that I came from, being hurt and playing hurt was not only okay, but celebrated. Being injured was not okay. And so when we draw that parallel, when you're hurt mentally versus injured mentally, I wonder if we're just reinforcing that stigma and I don't know, Adrian, I mean, what, what's your experience been? I, I feel like we need to change our sport cultural norms, period, not just around mental health, but, but like throughout, if we're going to make uh, positive moves um, for mental health and for athletes experiencing mental illness. Yeah, because I think we confuse harm and, and risk with this idea of actually just being disciplined and tough and you know pushing through challenge uh the two get conflated and then as Veronique was saying you know then we end up thinking it's really cool or remember you know the the strug the a gymnast who vaulted on a broken foot right and it was celebrated back then in the 84 olympics so hopefully we've come farther but i don't know the stigma's still there what do you think adrian i think krista was inviting you into that well <laughs> Um, I think that, um, we have a long way to go and we've also come a long way. I remember when I first moved back to Canada from the United States and we were doing a preseason and I'll just use this term. I know functional movement screen can be a bit controversial whether you use them or not, but that idea of under, um, kind of understanding people's vulnerabilities in their movement. And, you know, that was happening with a national team and, so at the time I had mentioned, oh, you know, maybe we should do a mental health screen with the idea that when you have pressure, you're going to break your most vulnerable part. And um, it was not a popular idea at the time. <laughs> In fact, it was suggested to me that they weren't sure why we'd want to know that information. Um, and for me, I was like, oh, I would find it empowering to know that information. But at the time, my voice definitely was not heard. And now we've moved several years later where we do have an integrated mental health strategy for high performance sport in our country. So I think we're starting to try. In my experience, um, it's a lack of comfort and familiarity, I think, that, that, that can be challenging. Even on Sunday, I was, um, actually it might not have been, I was basically flying home from summer. So it might've been Thursday. I can't remember when that was happening, you know. Um, <laughs> but um, I received a call from a strength coach and he was saying that, in the strength room, he had noticed an athlete was doing their training, like cycling, and they noticed cuts on their arm and he didn't know what to do about it. So then he called the coach later and, you know, just that mental health literacy, we're not sure what to do. We're not sure to ask the question. Do we make it worse if we ask the question? So I do think that I'm, it's not always intentional. I think it's a lack of understanding. I think also we sometimes forget that, um, you know, if someone's mentally well, they're going to perform better. It's not, you know, it's about what conditions can we take to thrive? How do we create an environment where we honestly see where people are at so that we have the information we need so we can help them? Because we talked about that psychological skills and making people mentally stronger. And people might have a pattern where when they're struggling in their performance, they do talk really negatively to themselves or they do get quite down. And that's not a great habit for performance. Self-compassion, as, as an example, was mentioned by Vero and I had an athlete who did a master's thesis where we looked at failure experience, had them attached to biofeedback, neurofeedback equipment. And we were looking at whether um, kind of whether they were self-compassionate, what that meant. And we found that people who are more self-compassionate had better heart rate variability, which is a great parameter for recovery, you know? And so a lot of times a concept like self-compassion is not very common in sports settings. We want people to be really hard on themselves. And yet, I'm not sure we do because when you look at the literature, people who are more self-compassionate say more committed to their goals. They have better recovery, they have better heart rate variability. You know, if you could take a pill that did all those things, it would be very popular, very popular supplement that we'd take. Um, and the last part I'd say about that as well is now when we look at research, there was another student um, who is, uh, as part of her master's thesis, she studied a concept called alexithymia, which I wasn't familiar with until she did that research. Um, and alexithymia is very much an inability to understand our emotions and an inability to express to other people what our emotions are. And Brene Brown's actually written a, a book recently called Atlas of the Heart that I, I read over the Christmas time that talks about unpacking all these different emotions. But what's really powerful about that is that we have learned that underlying most mental health conditions, so underlying alcoholism, depression, all this stuff that we have is alexithymia. 
that when people are better able to understand and express their emotion, they actually have less struggles with mental health. And so when I look at that and I look at sport and I look at this, you know, kids become very serious about sport at very young, young ages now. And do we have environments that keep their body well? And do we have environments that help them process the emotions they're experiencing? And I would say not always, not really, actually. Uh, you know, I see young children that are struggling with a performance. And if there's a tear, they get in trouble. Yet, hmm, then we're creating this, these conditions that will lead to mental health challenges long term, you know, so anyways, I just think it's interesting when we take a step back and look at some of those concepts, perhaps not a direct response to the answer, but you know how that goes, Jen, this is not uncommon for me. So there you go. <laughs> it's great. And it really, we don't have to go in any direction. But I think everything that you're bringing up is helping people uh, who are participating and who will watch later. Uh, identify the language, the science, the tools, some resources. Language is so important. We're hearing true science because I think sometimes we falsely attribute success to sacrifice and pushing through a concussion when actually we can see so much more performance success when someone's well and healthy and compassionate. Beautiful. And lots of, I want to draw everybody's attention to the chat because Adrian's been posting things and that's great. Lots of resources we can transfer that, that'll be in the recording, but also we can get that on our website, some good links, and I invite anybody to be sharing. We've got some comments. I wanted to go back to one of the original questions around human rights, and I think this ties in well, you know, is part of mental health skill development about being able to identify when there is a threat. So like Osaka was doing, you know, this, this press conference is not good for me, and wanting to have the right and the the, the power to be able to say, I don't want to participate right now. Is that part of it, being able to recognize threats? And your rights in terms of your mental health. What work do you do with athletes around that? I'm trying to turn my phone off, but it's just not listening to me. <laughs> okay. I can jump in. You, um, you know, I think in terms of mental health, um, knowing, as Krista said, what are my internal resources and what are my external resources? If, if I'm putting myself in harm's way, you know, do I have, do I have supports? Um, because I think there's a lot of circumstances in sport and this is why, you know, sport can be a real mechanism for enhancing one's mental health is because you put yourself in challenge. And the key is you've got to put it in the right amount of challenge. It has to be developmentally appropriate for your, your age and stage of cognitive, social, emotional maturity, as well as physical maturity. And, you know, I think Adrian was speaking a little bit to this earlier, you know, we see a lot of Olympians who are very physically talented, but may not have that emotional or social um, um, maturity yet or skills available to them to really not have harm be done to them in that certain circumstance. So, you know, we want to train resilience. Uh, we want to challenge, um, but we also have to be able to be okay with saying, I don't know what to do. And it's self-accept, that's that self-compassion part. This, this is where this hurts for me, whether it's I'm, a, I, I'm experiencing, as Krista said, you know, some not injury, but I'm, I'm feeling soreness. I'm feeling hurt. When I'm feeling hurt, I have to be able to know how to manage and take care of it um, so that I can continue to pursue my challenges. Um, Sometimes it means you gotta stop completely. Sometimes it means just resource up and then we can continue on, whether it's a taping or, you know, metaphorically. Yeah. And Natalie was referencing, you know, the buffer, the buffer that can be provided through health resources and, and that duty of care as well. Can you speak a little bit more about that now, Natalie? Sure. Um... Well, I guess maybe I'll backtrack a little bit to piggyback on what some have already mentioned, because I believe you, you, you mentioned uh, people's rights, right? That's where you had started off, Jennifer. It, I think um, 
what I'm seeing, and we have to recognize the strides that we've made, especially in the last couple of years in Canada. Uh, it's It's been phenomenal, but I agree with my colleagues that we still have a lot of work to do to educate, um, to increase the help seeking and reduce the stigma. But uh, what I'm seeing uh, more and more uh, is, is not only athletes, but coaches and even some staff uh, sort of, of uh, taking ownership of those rights that they have to say either uh, I need this to be able to to perform and do my job or I, I don't accept this I don't accept the environment in which you're asking me to do my job right now and more and more people are speaking up and we're seeing this so I think the more people feel comfortable doing that um, the more we're going to see uh, some some significant and positive changes because it has to happen at all levels from top down to bottom up. So I'm always happy to see uh, when people are actually speaking out or, or reaching out for the support that they need. Um, I'm happy to see uh, the the amazing work that we've done throughout the pandemic with the, um, the community of people uh, of mental health and mental performance uh, practitioners to collaboratively work together um, to be able to help support. Because if you want me to make that link again, uh, just some of the recent studies that, that we've been doing throughout the pandemic, some, uh, one of the study with Veronique and Laurie de Turbid is we're actually seeing that those athletes who have taken advantage of some of the extra time they had during the pandemic to, to work with their mental performance consultant, to work on strengthening their skills, actually, um, well, uh, coped better in general. And so it, it just provides more support for, for this type of work. Um, and, and sometimes you can do it on your own. Uh, just like uh, Charlene was giving some examples, you have to know you have to know your boundaries. You have to know uh, your limits and respect that. And and either you're able to engage in that self care on your own because you're aware and you feel like you have that knowledge and the skills to do it. And and in some cases you can't. And and it's not because you all of a sudden just like riding a bike uh, you forget how to do it. You know we all know how to manage our thoughts and emotions, but sometimes we're just overtaxed, we're overwhelmed, we are a bit lost and confused uh, amongst the, the uncertainty that we're living, and we need that extra help. So we're reaching out to our support um, team. And just as much as us here, as, as everybody else that we're here to serve. So uh, I would say, um, more and more people, and we're seeing this at the center, we're seeing this through the mental health network. Uh, when we say there's been an increase, uh, I, at least 300% increase in people seeking help this past year, you know, you, you don't like to hear that people are struggling, but I think it's normal that we've been struggling because of a very, everything we've had to go through uh, with the pandemic and some of the changes that we've seen, uh, but at least people are seeking help and that's really positive. And so a silver lining of this is a great quote, um, never waste a crisis, right? And, and it has been such an amazing learning, both by highlighting mental health, we're talking about it more, great, the discourse is heightened for sure, but also opportunities for people to come forward. And uh, like, like Simone Biles, Naomi, people speaking out and using their voice around it. Great to see these numbers, terrible to see them, but good to see them because it's also a measure of that people are actually reaching out for help more. And there, I wanna draw people's attention to the, the chat. There's some great stuff going on there. And I like having the dual, you know, we're having a conversation here. There can be also things happening in the chat. That's cool. And so resources are being posted by people who've come to the webinar, by our panelists as well. Some questions, we'll get to all of them as we, as we move along. Some fabulous people in the audience as well, you know, incredible professionals who have lots of resources to share. Uh, I have a couple of students, Paula and Jess, out in Calgary who have developed an app I shared with this group earlier called Hone, which is designed to monitor mental health and uh, then feed that back to athletes and their coaches in general. So it's anonymous, but they get a reading on their team, which is a great little tool to have. 
We have comments around stigma falling along gender line. So keep the conversation going in the chat and uh, we'll get there, we'll get there. I also wanna make sure I leave space at the end to, for people to put on their mic if they wanna ask a question as well to the panel. But this leads into this idea that, you know, sport is also a, an avenue and uh, a space where we can actually teach people like sport can be that blueprint. It can be that uh, vehicle for learning and education. And we're seeing athletes step up and be those voices for change like Clara Hughes with the Let's Talk, et cetera. Uh, and what other ways could we better leverage sport or can mental health be strengthened through sport? How could we do a better job in sport? Maybe I'll jump in here. Uh, you know, after a lot of reflection, after talking with so many different people, uh, I'm at a place where I'm thinking that um, we have to invest more into helping coaches support athletes. And I say that because um, coaches are the, the, the people who spend the most time with athletes on the field. And it seems to me that if they're going to be the people spending the most time and actually sort of being the, the lead in creating the environment in which athletes are asked to, to train and compete, um, we see, I, I would like to see us invest more time and resources in supporting coaches to be able to do that, so uh, you know, a good job and to be able to create those safe sport uh, environments for athletes to develop and thrive. Um, I, I know that, and, a lot of coaches have uh, taken the, the initiative in the last couple of years to educate themselves more and, and we're seeing webinars being offered, but sometimes one webinar is just not enough to, to feel comfortable and to really understand and, and how, how to interact. Because when you think about the training that coaches get compared to the technical, tactical, physical types of training, the sports psychology training that they get to do their job. Um, yes, there are definitely some great uh, coaching modules out there for them. But uh, I, I, I just think that for us to continue moving in the right direction, it would be great to see more work done uh, whether it's through our mental performance consultants, whether uh, it's through um, the NSOs, but uh, I, I think that'll be a, a, a good next step. And I, I know the Coaching Association of Canada is doing some really uh, good work. Uh, hopefully um, we're gonna get, uh, there's a multi-partner initiative to get a, a grant to be able to start developing uh, resources and programs for coaches. So, uh, uh, this this is this is where my thinking is at in terms of some of the next steps that we have to pay attention to. Krista. Um, along those lines, in addition to helping coaches um, have these conversations, and I think helping coaches um, coach differently, you know, I, finding we're we're reinforcing the style of coaching that we were coached as. Um, and so we're saying, you know, don't use coaching practices that are harmful to mental health, but we're not teaching coaches another way to approach it. Autonomy support, um, you know, ways that we can help our athletes optimally perform that are not damaging to their mental health and might actually promote mental health. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is what I'm hearing anecdotally within the system is that our coaches are not well, our coaches are struggling with their mental health. But when I look at the numbers of who's coming to get support, there's almost no coaches reaching out. And so it seems like there's a barrier there, um, a stigma. Coaches are supposed to have all the answers. Coaches are supposed to be strong and be these models for their athletes. Well, maybe being the role model is asking for help and what a strong you know, move that is. So I really want to help coaches feel safe in, in, in asking for support as well, because we know that their mental health directly influences the environment that they're creating for their athletes. So the trickle down effect is going to be huge. Right. Brilliant. Yeah. And some chatter in the chat as well around, uh, I may be able to kind of look after myself, identify things that are threatening to my mental health, but, and then if the stigma continues, and I'm judged, how do I navigate that? And again, I think 
just continually advancing the narrative, the discourse, heightening the conversation around the importance and value of mental health for well-being, but also for performance if we're talking about sport uh, and the role media plays, the role athlete voice plays, the role leadership plays. So back to the coaches, being able to say, um, I'm, I'm a good coach because I'm also modeling that I'm caring for myself. Wonderful to see, but we need to support them to be able to do that. And they're caught in these cultural norms as well. It's, it's quite tangly, but I'm loving how everyone's teasing everything apart, both here in the panel and also in the chat. Other comments about, yes, Charlene. Yeah, I, I also think there's a real need to communicate and educate around the different professionals mm -hmm. and their scope of practice. So we've been talking about mental performance consultants and mental health practitioners. And those are two uh, broad categories of professionals. And, you know, there's a scope of practice. While there's complementary and they can work very well together, um, there's some overlap as well. And, you know, I, I'm often referred to as a sports psychologist, and that is not a legal profession in Canada. <laughs> so I, I, I am not a sports psychologist. I have studied sports psychology, <laughs> but I have not, I'm not a sports psychologist. I'm a mental performance consultant because my training is in sports science. Um, um, so you know, I'm not a clinical counselor or a registered psychologist. And so I think it's really, really important because when we talk about how to equip people to buffer, create buffers to teach skills, we have to know who are the right people to, to secure that help from. Um, where are the safe spaces and places? Who are the right professionals in the sport environment? Um, that, I think that also needs some clarity. And this has been fabulous, all of you just clarifying, teasing apart, using the correct words, distinguishing between norms and uh, conceptualizations. Beautiful. Great comment in the chat around uh, community level. So NS, the national sport organizations often have extra resources to hire a mental performance consultant or a uh, uh, a psychologist to help their athletes or their coaches, but what do we do at more of a grassroots or community level? I was actually just going to say that, Jen, and I'm sorry to jump back in here and not give my other panelists a, a voice on this, but you know, one of the things that really concerns me is that we hear a lot from elite athletes, which is fantastic, but we don't hear a lot from maybe even professional athletes and youth athletes. And until we have drug abuse, until we have assault, until we have suicide, and, and that certainly is not in the harm category, that would be in illness, <laughs> right? When you get to those kinds of extreme stories and that there's an issue and a problem, um, hearing the voices and validating all voices of what harm looks like at different ages and stages is super important for us to to just not only recognize that this is normal, this 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 happens. It's not it's not you know not all youth need to be cheery and happy all the time. It's not necessarily like that. That's not reality, and and that you know everybody as a community can support. So I'll just I just threw that in there. Yeah, yeah. So again, the role of discourse is playing and trying to remove stigma and normalize our attention to both many realms of health, right? Not just physical or mental even, okay. Other comments on that, community level support, Veronique. Yes, I can add to that. Um, I mean, we, all the attention is often focused on the eye level, like you mentioned, uh, Charlene and Jen. And we have to think about maybe revisiting some, some of the, the values and mission that, that some organization, uh, organization has toward why are we um, giving importance to developing athletes to performance? What are the values behind that? And what are the repercussions of the way we are investing or prioritizing medals on the, the youth level development athletes and all of these cultural norms that we mentioned that are probably 
very there at the eye level is influencing the, the youths who, who are looking to be part of the national teams and who are inspired by uh, what they see at the elite levels. So it's nice to see that some, some elite athletes that are famous uh, came out loud about their mental health struggles because it's definitely a good example for young athletes who might think that uh, it's not existing at the, the eye level. But also, yeah, just maybe re revisiting the mission and values. Why is it important for us as a, a country, an organization to invest in, in athletes, in sports? Is it only for the medals or is there any other advantage of uh, wanting our young athlete to do sports and develop through sports and become citizen through the skills they are developing in sports. And sometimes I think we kind of lost that in the way. So this is one thing. And the other thing is that I often hear at the youth level, development level, coaches, um, administrators who are really concerned about their athletes mental health and they see problems and they are willing to do some things but sometimes everything is done in silo and everyone is like providing some support or developing initiatives and we have seen I think within the pandemic that communicating sharing uh, is so valuable and at the end I think that we everyone advocate for uh, mental health support. And we all want that our youth athletes and high level athletes um, have good mental health. So maybe we can think more in collaboration and in a more yeah, collaborative uh, way of planning action uh, toward that goal. So that would be two comments I can add to that uh, question. Beautiful and all lessons that sport has to teach us, right? If you know, we've all fallen in love with sport for these these concepts of what it what it's taught us that is so powerful. And back to your comment about the medals as a focus, it, it reminds me of a common theme today of very careful language. We need to be much more intentional and very careful about what we're prioritizing, how we're describing things, how we're differentiating. And, and focusing on the medal as though it's a measure of success or excellence is false, right? Medals are pretty random. Um, you, we've seen them, you know, close semi race that could determine whether you make the final or not, but the final could look totally different on another day. So medals are pretty uh, unpredictable. What are we really, what should we be focusing on? If it isn't medals, what should we be focusing? What is sport for that would help with this culture of, Wellness. Natalie? I, I'll jump in. For me, in the work that I've done for the last 26 years, uh, performance has always gone hand in hand with, with well being, with mental health. And I think. I think that this is the cultural change we need in sport is that we, we, we see it. We see Vero had just talked about values and you, you read the mission and vision of different clubs, different teams, and, and they're all about developing people, but their actions don't match that. And so I, I sincerely think that the whole sports system has to buy into prioritizing mental health just as much as performance. They should go hand in hand and, and that one should not occur at the detriment of the other. And if, if everybody buys into right from the beginning when kids are getting involved in sport, that mental health is going to be just as important as performance or more important in some cases, depending on what the, the whole purpose of the activity is, you know, we're not going to start seeing this huge discrepancy because many athletes have told us as, as, as they climb through the ranks of sport, it becomes about performance, winning medals, very much at the expense of their mental health and well-being. And if they want to make it to this level, they better be ready to sacrifice that. Yeah. 
But that, that shouldn't even be part of the equation. If everybody can agree that we're going to help people become better performers and help them develop to the level that they have the potential to be at, but will support and continue fostering and protecting their mental health in this post. I would do everything we can to support both of these things going hand in hand. We're going to have some really phenomenal performers and some pretty healthy people doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so just to add something, I just had a recent conversation and, you know, the sad part, I think, and the, the huge risk when we don't do this, when we don't protect the well-being and mental health of, of people in sport is we're, we're going to lose them permanently. And how many coaches have we lost? How many athletes have we lost because they've burnt out, they've dropped out, they've been, they've been so mistreated or maltreated, I should say, that they don't want anything to do with their sport anymore. And they don't, you know, that's it. They're done. They don't give back to the sport that they initially fell in love with. And, and we're doing a disservice to the sport and, and to society, community and society. Uh, the, when, once we start making that change and protecting people's overall health and well-being, they are going to stay in sport. They're going to retire as athletes. They're going to want to continue as coaches, as administrators. Um, they're going to be great parents supporting their kids. And they're not going to repeat, you know, some of the, some of the, the, the faux pas that we've seen in sport uh, where, where performance is prioritized at all costs. I, I'm a sport parent. Um, it's easy to get this, the life suck sucked right out of you as a sport parent when you get caught up in this culture where your kids have to be training all year round it takes a lot of courage um and 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 i would say well i, I would say strong values to to stand up to a coach in an organization and say no i'm not buying into your model my kid's not going to do five extra camps during the summer just to have a chance to be on your team and so I'm seeing some comments in the chat about parents. Uh, the whole system has to buy into this new philosophy where mental health is part of everyone's um, vision for sport. Yeah, there is no performance without mental health, frankly, or physical health. And uh, get that right, first of all. We got lots of science proving that, but also a lot of language around it. And then this idea that what are you here to do as a coach, not win a medal? but to develop human beings who will then develop society right, and give back to society. So we're, we're getting that all wrong. <laughs> Some real flawed thinking in the world right now and in our country too, I would say, but wow, what a great group of people right here today who are really advancing this concept that what we really need to be focusing on is more holistic. And, uh, and frankly, you'll get better performances, right? If you factor in. So wouldn't it be lovely if, if you only got a medal, if everyone was also healthy, <laughs> you know, you win only if you're all healthy at the same time. Otherwise, you're not really winning. Uh, some thought, uh, some great conversations, and I, I don't even really need to bring these questions in because people are, you know, again, multitasking and being able to answer some of the questions. Uh, but a comment raised here from Allison around, really around our long-term athlete development kind of approach in Canada. And, and I've always it's fine, you know, and it's about readiness and developing at various stages. And I think that language has been embraced at community levels fairly well. But, and there's a little thread in there around socio-emotional development, but really it's around, you know, nutrition, almost like life skills. It's not so much around the mental health skills and really understanding that you need to be developing your spirit and your soul and your mind, as well as uh, your body. And that it's not just about developing your ability to focus in order to perform better you know it's also about well-being so it'd be lovely to see that model expanded a little mm -hmm. bit comments about that around development ages and stages readiness for for being introduced to these kinds of mental health skills there is actually a mental health mod or a mental performance module with the ltad I can, yeah. yeah, so. And do you so, feel, Charlene, that it speaks to mental health as well enough? No. 
we'll, we'll get on that, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, that it's really exciting in, in high performance sport. Um, um, number of the women on this panel were involved in a project of identifying the mental skills elite athletes um, require to thrive in the high performance environment. Um, Krista is involved in an organization that directly uh, impacts athlete, elite athletes' uh, lifestyles and adopting healthy lifestyles um, that enable performance. Um, you know, I, I think it, you know, we haven't had a culture where, and I, and, you know, you asked the question earlier around, is it only in sport? And, you know, I don't work in another context other than sport, um, you know, Adrian or others on this panel might be better able to speak to that, but, you know, I, I've been around academics, I've been around, you know, other leaders and, and I think they strive to be high performance as well. And that high performances comes with a lot of terminology and vernacular, like, you know, no pain, no gain. And, um, and it doesn't quite matter <laughs> the context or, or leaders must be everything and perfect. And, um, you know, and they must be strong and they can't show vulnerability. Um, and of course, Brene Brown is, is shooting that one right in the foot as well. And that leadership is about vulnerability. Um, and, and, and that enables mental health. So, you know, I think, I think my point and my, my uh, contribution here is just that, you know, it, I think it is a huge cultural shift. It's in a lot of different ages and stages um, and that we should continue to teach skills. Um, I come from that mental performance consultant space. So I'm a big advocate for teaching the skills and equipping the resources and internal assets that one has, um, uh, you know, as, as, as part of contributing to mental health. Okay, and Krista, you had your mic on there a minute ago. Did you wanna contribute? I don't know, but I, I could say that, I mean, the responsibility to teach what I think is a fundamental life skill, that is that emotional literacy, uh, mental health literacy, and the skills to stay well does not just lie with the sports sector. Obviously, that's what we're talking about today, but I really feel that we should be learning this in school. You know, um, I was, what, 19, 20 when I first experienced what I recognized as depression I had never heard of the word mental health in, you know, all, all the way along in school and sport. So I didn't even know what was happening to me. Um, I don't think that you can start too early. I, for sure, um, if and when I choose to have children, you know, right out of the womb, we're going to be talking about mental health and emotions. And I think it's so important. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful to see all right, and uh, lots of great resources being posted in the chat. Thank you, everybody. There are so many videos and cases and stories and movies that we can watch, things we can read. Um, love this idea of pushing to support uh, the coaches, teachers, parents, you know, equipping people with skills to better support athletes. Uh, Barriers. Let's finish off with what are what's the work to be done? We've talked about stigma. We've talked about shifting values and norms culturally, uh, leveraging the discourse, media, voice, those in you know the high performing athletes at the Olympic level, but also uh, working into educational system, the sports systems. What are some of the other barriers that you think exist that we still need to work through? I'm going to jump in again. Um, I said this in the chat, but I think when, when we're truly prioritizing something, then we're also funding it. Um, and so, I mean, we're all working in high performance sport, but it, every time I get an athlete who's a development athlete or somebody further down the pathway that asks for help and I can't give it because the mandate of my organization is not focused on that level, it just breaks my heart. Um, so if I, I really think there's a great business case for the high performance sector, for you know, provincial governments to invest in this mental health education for um, athletes further down the pathway, because you're going to have a better, healthier pool to draw from when athletes do reach the national level. We won't see as much dropout. 
we will see people who are, you know, ready to compete and take on that, the burden and the stress of competing at a very high level. Other comments about barriers? I've got one last question for you that I'm just personally very curious about. Popped up in the chat. Is there, is there a difference between elite and developmental sport? Different requirements for skills? Should we treat athletes differently? I think there's a lot of evidence to show that mental skills can be taught at all levels. I mean, if you look at uh, Terry Orlick's work, he certainly uh, was a, a great proponent of that. And, and just like Krista said, the, the sooner we can teach our kids about uh, the, the, the value of developing mental skills, mental health, uh, I think the more equipped they're going to be. So um, yes, you want to apply uh, and adapt the content, the language to their maturity level. But the word stress is very common to, to people across all ages. And if you go into schools and start talking even to five, six, seven-year-olds, you know, what stress and what stresses you out, they're still able to converse about that. So it, it's about adapting to, to them to make sure that it's not too complicated and, and it, it, they, it, it's, it's done in a way that's fun, engaging, um, um, and, and that they can obviously understand it. But uh, for me, yes, there are differences in terms of demands at different levels. But I think if we're talking more about knowledge and skills, there's value um, in teaching that across the span. Thank you. And I think we should wrap it up there. We're at 1.30 some fabulous resources uh, that we will, of course, also translate onto the website here. And I want to thank our panelists. That was fabulous. Just such an incredible wealth of insight, stories, identifying the things we need to be focusing on, the language we need to be advancing and highlighting, promoting. Really appreciate, again, the work that you're doing in this area and the work you're doing on behalf of sport, because I do think we all agree it is a, a beautiful thing that we need to continue to take care of, right? And, uh, all of, and all of its power and ability to inspire everyone, really, not just youth. Thank you. And everyone's saying farewell in the chat. Hope to see you all again. We have one more. Well, we have another. It'll probably go on forever. Actually, this series is supposed to be six episodes and it just keeps going, which is great. Our next one is in March and we have a number of uh, fantastic guests. We'll send out some info on that, but around diversity and representation in and through sport and some of the challenges we face. So thanks again to all of our panelists, Charlene Orr, Adrian Leslie Tugood, Veronique Boudreau, Krista Van Slingerland, and Natalie Duran Bush. Really appreciate the time. Us. Thanks for organizing this, Jennifer. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Take care. Take care. Bye, everyone.